Welcome everybody. It is just about that time to start our program. For those of you who are just joining us, we have quite the program in store tonight. My name is Celine Figueroa and I am with the Museum of uh, Denver Museum of Nature and Science and I'll be your virtual host this evening. Uh, as you all know, we're talking about love bugs and we have such a great crew. What I'm going to go ahead and do is link the, uh, the love bugs video for anybody who hasn't gotten a chance to see it or wants to see it again, because it's definitely on my rewatch list. Um, so that is in the chat there for you all to save for later. As you're watching the presentation tonight, please go ahead and use that chat box and put any questions and comments that you have. I'll keep an eye on them and we'll do my best to ask them during our Q&A section. Um, we have so many people on tonight and hopefully we'll be able to get to all of your questions. I apologize in advance if we cannot. Uh, to begin tonight's program, I'd like to introduce uh, Frank Krell, who is the Senior Curator of Entomology here at the Museum of Nature and Science. Frank, thank you so much for being here. Hello, um, I'm very happy to be here indeed because that wonderful movie that we are talking about today is, is, is something that is very close to my life and to my heart. Uh, the love bugs, well, this is, this is just something that, that, that drives all of us, the love to, for, for bugs, for nature, and also for each other, for other people who have the same, well, the same drive. And the movie, The Love Bugs, is even about two people who have the same drive and entomology, but also together and towards each other. They found each other and they lived together and uh, married and were a wonderful couple for an immensely long time. So what is the love bugs about? It's about amassing an invaluable collection of bugs, of beetles, of insects, of plant hoppers, in the case of Lois. And uh, for, for many people, that's probably not important. That's not something that's a, just a weird hobby or something. But it's not. It's much more of that. It's probably a weird hobby too. But well, we know that I, I, when I first started doing that, I remember uh, how my parents looked at me. But with time, they understood. It took long, but they understood what it was all about. And these collections, collections of um, specimens from nature, from collections of biodiversity, they document the state of the biodiversity on Earth. If we didn't have these collections, we wouldn't know whether species get extinct, whether species have different distributions with the changing climate, whether species invade somewhere or disappear from areas. These collections formed the natural history museums. All natural history museums, or at least the older ones, they are formed from, they're compiled by, well, private collections. There were private collectors that, that, who did it as a hobby or as a passion and amassed large collections. And then they give them to, to a, a public museum, be it the museum at the Arizona State or our museum at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science or even older museums in Europe. These museums are all composed of the work of amateur collectors, of private collectors. And only much later, uh, professional, well, scientists were employed in these museums and uh, helped to, to build them up. But um, we, would, we would know, without private collectors, we would know very little about the development of the natural world um, in our country and in the world. So this is absolutely an important part of the scientific endeavor 
to have people like the O'Briens to compile these collections. And then when, well, when they're getting a little bit older than I am uh, and uh, uh, don't feel they, they cannot do it on their own anymore, then giving them to a, to a responsible public collection, public museum like ASU, um, where they can be used in eternity. In the movie, Lois said something that the collection will stay there for a couple of centuries. Well, I would say if it's a good museum and it is, then uh, we would probably talk rather about millennia. We do not have an end point of our documentation of the natural world. We want to keep these things forever in eternity. And most one. museums are made like this and are set up like this to keep these collections forever for future generations of scientists to study and for future generations of normal people just to enjoy and learn from them. I've seen specimens that were collected 250 years ago. Wow. And they, they look beautiful. They've yes. been carefully cared for. So the oldest pinned specimen is a, is a white butterfly from I think 1712 in the museum in Oxford. I've seen, once I've seen a, a photo of it and well, it was a little bit old, but looked still good. And you could still see all the characters and everything. That's the, the advantage if you have an exoskeleton as an insect. <laughs> Everything just dries out inside, and the skeleton, the the well, the mummified hull, the, the 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 outside stays as it is. Well, we have a disadvantage. We <laughs> if we dry out, we look much different from what we looked in life. But insects, they don't. You put a pin through, let it dry, and you have the complete specimen in all its beauty. So should we just introduce all these people that are here on the panel? So we have Lois O'Brien. If you have seen the movie, you have seen her uh, in that movie. She's, well, one of the main characters uh, playing herself. And uh, it's, it's just wonderful to have her here um, at a much advanced age than I am, and I feel my age sometimes these days, but uh, I can't even imagine how it is to be almost 40 years older. Um, then we have Nico Franz. Nico Franz is professor and uh, the director of the uh, bio collections at Arizona State University. That's where the O'Brien's collection went. So Nico, yeah, he's just giving a sign, that's Nico. He uh, is one of, one of those uh, originally Germans who like me, who uh, ended up in this country and uh, seems to be quite happy here like I am. And uh, are you still German, Nico? That's kind of personal. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I actually became uh, an American citizen about a week ago. So uh, finally. Congratulations, Frank. I think Nico uh, wrote his, his first scientific paper in German, his second in, I, I don't know it was second, but then one in, in, in Spanish from Costa Rica. And now he writes in English from here. That's about the same with me. I never wrote anything in Spanish. I did actually write something in French when I worked in, in the Cote d'Ivoire in Ivory Coast, uh, where the main language spoken is French as a former colonial language. Um, but I wrote my first papers in, in German. Uh, that is not what you do when you live in the United States um, and uh, want to be understood. So I rarely write in German anymore, and I hope that will not lead to me forgetting everything. But, well, we have kids that we raise bilingually, so uh, that, that helps a little bit to maintain the roots. But yeah, English is not too bad a language, right? It's, <laughs> there's lots of words, 
but uh, it's, uh, it's quite suitable for scientific communication. So Lois, how, well, we've seen that you gave up all this collection that was, that was your life to ASU, to uh, Arizona State University. How, how did that feel? It, it, it was disappointing, but I did keep seven drawers that I have here of my, my things, not of the weevils. And whenever I, I was able to display them once before COVID came and we're talking about displaying them again after we all get, get our inoculations and answering questions. So I feel disappointed when I go out in Midtown Phoenix and can only find a, a honeybee, but <laughs> can't even find an ant. <laughs> but, um, it's a sort of developed area of the world and where we live, not much else likes to live apart from dogs and doves and things. But uh, yeah, we, Phoenix is, well, it's in the middle of the desert. What do you expect with some lawns, well-watered lawns? Well, um, Nico could tell you more about collecting around here than I can because uh, I lived in Tucson for a while and we yeah. usually went to the mountains. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Phoenix is a little bit warm and dry but yeah, where people live, that it's, you you will find some uh, probably some invasive pest species around your place or something like this. Well, thank heavens, the um, spotted lanternfly hasn't reached us here yet. The one introduced from China mm -hmm. that's in the eastern United States and Pennsylvania and reproducing at a terrific rate. So, do you feel that it's a um, well, that you, well, you, you, you now don't, you do not have the responsibility to maintain this enormous collection anymore. So that is probably a relief, right? Yes, except for one thing. ASU has a different, they use Cornell unit trays, which are the little boxes that you put each species in, they're different mm -hmm. sizes for each species. And I had Cal Academy, and now they're bringing me the drawers and letting me transfer. So I, I still feel that I'm doing some contribution to entomology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you certainly do. Yeah, there are these different, different standards, a few different standards of drawers and unit trays in the United States. In uh, Europe, if you go to Europe, there's everything different again. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a little bit um, a little bit of a nuisance that there are different standards, but uh, well, no standard actually has just one. So they coexist. We have Cornell too. So, um, and we are happily living with that. But if you get a donation with another size of drawers or unit trays, yes, of course we have to transfer everything. That's, that's part of the freedom in this country, right? You are not forced to do one system or something. You can still choose. But the disadvantage is that uh, it's not everything so perfectly standardized. Well, that you, well. Cornell is maintaining its, its collection, I, I, I believe. And Cal Academy is now emphasizing tourists and citizen science and, and not doing research on it anymore. So, well, they still do some research, but the uh, citizen science part has grown quite a bit because that's, well, that they want to engage people in um, mm -hmm. recognizing nature and being, being a part of the scientific process. Science has not, has not the, highest, the highest reputation in this country anymore. It's not as, as important as it should be. So getting people engaged and learning about how to do it is, is certainly a good thing. And it takes a lot of uh, time and personnel to run such projects as a museum. That's why we don't have a big citizen science uh, uh, component, but we have lots of volunteers. We had in uh, 
pre-COVID times, we had, I think, 1,800 volunteers. Wow. Of them worked behind That's the scenes. Fantastic. So if, I had if, if if only if each one only brought in one new insect a year. Yeah. Woo. And they, they collected stuff. They collected stuff for us, but they also helped us working in the collection. So mm -hmm. we didn't have to do the transferring and things like that all the time or the labeling. I have a labeling volunteer who is now 85. And he he can't wait getting back to labeling in the collection. Good. But uh, because of COVID, we can't do that right now. I have a quick question. Um, Nico, I, when I was filming, of course, I saw the collection being transferred um, to ASU, but I'm kind of wondering, uh, what is the status of it now? And um, were you, did you find any new specimens, you know, as you were digitizing everything? Thank you, Allison. Uh, I'm sorry, there's a little bit of feedback. I'm actually in the same apartment as Lois and Chandler. So we are 80% done with transferring the collection into the kind of system that you see behind me, except for that uh, photo that I took earlier today uh, that Frank and Lois were talking about. Uh, I already pasted into the chat uh, a couple of links um, with uh, sets of images of the collections uh, that of the specimens that we're digitizing. Uh, so we are reorganizing the collection. Uh, we are publishing data about individual specimens, uh, including high resolution images. This is a project that's been ongoing for almost three years that's funded by the National Science Foundation. And um, somewhat of an item of pride, uh, we currently have uh, four PhD students working on weevils at right. ASU. And um, so that uh, promise of the collection being somewhat of a magnet uh, to attract a new generation of researchers, uh, I think we've made some progress of, of advancing that. And Nico also, in his thesis, studied the activities of the weevils he was doing. Now, I look at a weevil and or, or a plant hopper and it sucks juices from the tree or chews leaves, but I can't, don't have a life history, but he has a fantastic life history in the group he was studying. And that's fascinating too, to, to study. Yes, that's right. We should, we should never only sit in our collections and, uh, and work with with the prepared, with the dead material, we should continue studying nature outside and we should continue collecting because the change that happens to biodiversity is not stopping suddenly. We need to continue documenting the, the biodiversity that is around us to document that ongoing change, particularly now that we are in time when probably an increasing number of species will become extinct due to uh, climate uh, changes or due to, um, well, what we call development. So uh, destroying natural habitats in favor of what we would like to do in these areas, uh, be it, well, having uh, a cattle extensive cattle far, uh, ranch in a place where there was tropical rainforest or a big housing development in the foothills here in Colorado. Um, all this destroys habitat that can be crucial for some species. And if we do not uh, continue collecting for museums or uh, for private collections that go into museums later, we will, we will just not have this information. There are never enough targeted projects to tackle these questions. We just have to have a comprehensive collection effort just continuing uh, over time. That, that's an important thing to do. And if it can be done with citizen scientists, that's wonderful. Uh, but uh, we need, of course, some people that are uh, professionals and leading these efforts and know what they're doing uh, in, in, in depth. So uh, yeah, we, 
need these museums, natural history museums and their research programs to go on. I, I had another question. Um, Lois, when did you when did you and Charlie first start putting the collection together? And then I, I can't remember how many years over the span of how many years, was it 60 years? And like, what was, mm -hmm. when did you first start putting it together? We married in 62. Six, six to 62, June 2nd, 62. And we'd uh, known each other for about two years before that. So say 1960 till now, takes a while. Yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty impressive. And I know that uh, in the film you mentioned um, the time that you out collected Charlie do you have another, like another favorite um, story about collecting? Well, I, I, I don't know that it's a favorite story, but to give you an idea, when we would get to a, a forest and there'd be a path through it, he would take one side of the path and I would take the other side and we would go down beating into our sheets. A, a sheet is a, is a, the first sheet was an umbrella. That's what the first people used. And the insects fall into the into this concave place. And then you, you suck them up or, or um, pick them up, depending on the size. I have, a, oh. <laughs> I have part of an aspirator here. This is missing the, the uh, plastic that was is soft and goes, whoops. So you suck it into your, you suck, how you, does that work? You suck, yeah, you, you suck it, the insect into the, into the tube. I, Nico, I can't, I'm not showing. Nico? Yeah. I'm not. Oh. Oh, it. Oops. Something? Wait. I don't know. Yes, you did. There you are. You, you, um have this tube and you suck the insect in through here and you have a plastic tube that you put around your neck and and suck and then the insect comes in here there's a little piece of mesh to keep it from co coming into your mouth and it makes it much faster you can just go suck 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 and and get them in here and um that's that's how we get so many because you, you want to be sure to have a male and a female if you can of each species. And so that takes what we consider a minimum of six. And I don't know of any museum that will give you a specimen if they only have five specimens. <laughs> that, that, that happens with the British Museum that they sometimes will exchange, but they, they'll keep that last six specimens to make sure they've got a male and a female. I know you, you brought your peanut bug. Will you show it to everybody? Uh, you gotta lift it a little higher. Uh, I'll take it out of here. Oh, perfect. And where did you collect this one? Uh, I don't really know. I'd have to take the label down, but somewhere in South America. Oh, if you lift it up a little higher, we can see. Oh, yeah, there. Oh, yeah. It, it's very common for insects to have a, an eye spot on the hind wing. They usually sit on trees with their with their fore wings covering the hind wings. And then if a bird comes up, they open them and the bird says, ah, it's bigger than I am. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to fly away. I'm not going to try to eat that one. And this one's called a peanut bug because the head looks like a peanut. Mm. Only if you look at it sideways, see if I can do this. Yeah. Yep. There I see it. Mm -hmm. it. It looks more like um, an alligator or a crocodile. And the people are afraid of this. They say it zigzags through the forest, killing anything it touches. That's not true. It does, mm -hmm. but but they say don't go out in that field. There are peanut bugs out there. 
I say it's a, and a peanut bug is a plant topper, right? Yes. It's it's a homopteran. Uh, homoptera means the uh, hmm. Well, hemiptera means has two wings and then a, a section of four wings, the front wings and the and the hind wings. But uh, hem, uh, homoptera is a section. And by golly, I've forgotten. Nico, can you remember <laughs> why it's a home office? Yeah. Oh, wait, I'm muted. You <laughs> I believe they do not have a single common name. Include aphids, scale insects, cicadas, leaf hoppers, plant hoppers, and close relatives. Thank you. Loaded. Sometimes it's not nice to be 93. You forget things. Fortunately, I have many, many memories. So I can forget a lot and still be happy. <laughs> okay. Yeah, these collections that we, that the O'Brien's compiled or that, uh, that museums uh, preserve, these collections are always a source of new discoveries. You would think, well, you have it in the collection, it's labeled, it's there, and then it can start uh, uh, getting dusty and forget forgotten. That's not the case. These collections are very active. People continue working with them. They, there are scientists, international scientists, national scientists that work with such collections all the time. Well, COVID has reduced that exchange a little bit, but it will go back to normal at some point, probably end of this year. Uh, but these these specimens in, in museums are used. They are continuously used. Sometimes, well, not every specimen is used or every year. It, uh, probably they will be used every 50 years. But um, there are always people studying these specimens and making new discoveries. So you can, if you cannot go into a place where you can collect new species, new for science in nature, you can go into museums and look at uh, material that hasn't been studied for a while or hasn't been identified at all or has been wrongly identified. And you can always find some new things in museums. When I first went through the prehistoric journey of collection, no, not collection, exhibit in, in Denver, in the Denver Museum, a wonderful uh, paleontology um, um, exhibit. I've, I've seen a beetle uh, that was unlike any other beetle I have seen before because it was preserved in a way I had never seen before. Um, let's see if I can just show that quickly. It was there on exhibit, this one. It was there on exhibit uh, for years and years and years. And then I thought, well, this is so pretty. You, you normally don't find that in uh, compression fossils of beetles. They, fossils of beetles normally look like roadkill. Uh, and not very nice and uh, not very colorful and uh, not very many details. There are detailed uh, beetles preserved, but not in that way. And I thought, well, so somebody will certainly have described that and have written a scientific paper on that. And then I found out, no, nobody has ever, it was there on exhibit for decades. It was published in two books, but it has never been described. And uh, so that's what I did in the last few weeks, months uh, to to get to it and see what it actually is. It was described as a longhorn beetle, but it's not. It's actually, let me see if I show you the reconstruction that we made from that. Wow. Actually leaf beetle, it's a frog-legged leaf beetle. And uh, they are very, very rare in the, in the fossil record. And uh, there's none known like this with uh, with this sort of uh, pattern on the wing cases. Wing cases are normally preserved as just dark blobs, 
Um, but this one has these uh, high resolution and high contrast pattern, which is unique. And uh, well, so I, I've worked on that for a while. It's not actually my group of insects that I'm working with. I work with scarab beetles, dung beetles, tune bugs and things like that, not with leaf beetles, but this was so fascinating that I worked on that. And uh, it's now actually it's, it's submitted and it will be named. Well, how you, you, you then have the freedom to name it however you want, not after yourself. That's not considered nice. <laughs> um, but uh, so I thought, well, who can I name that for if I name it? And well, the, uh, it's such a beautiful beetle. It deserves um, a, a very special name. So I named it for Sir David Attenborough. The natural naturalist broadcaster, and he agreed to be uh, uh, honored by this, by this beetle, by this naming of this beetle. So that will hopefully be out next year. So you can even going through the exhibits of a museum, you can find new things that uh, that uh, warrant publication. And this is just uh, probably the the best example ever published or ever seen of, uh, of, of patterns on wing cases of beetles. How many so, thousands yeah. of years old is it? Oh, that is about 50 million years old. It's a little bit less than 50 million years old, 49 something. It's from the Green River Formation in Colorado. Wow. And Frank, we all got to see the beautiful images um, with your share screen. I'd love to hear first impressions. Lois, what did you think of that? Nico, what did you think of the fossil? I'd love to hear what you all, you all thought. Truth be told, I was busy trying to <laughs> answer some questions in the chat, but yeah, the preservation and the amount of detail and the whole story is, um, is amazing. Uh, fossils are special. Oftentimes we only get one or two specimens, maybe. And um, there's an extra level of um, scientific detective work and bringing different parts of knowledge together to a hopefully a coherent package of new knowledge. So uh, they, um, they have a special role to play in our, in our uh, science and and also give us, of course, a, a deeper temporal understanding of uh, of um, uh, developments of of natural communities over great time spans. Thank you, Nico. Lois, what were your thoughts? I saw your face going like ooh and ah as uh, Frank was sharing the images. I'd love to to know your first impressions. That was really impressive. It, it, it's a beautiful beautiful beetle and we we have family trees of insects but to have something that old that substantiates our or changes idea, our idea whatever it is contributes to our idea the accuracy of it is absolutely fantastic wow I am still a little bit in shock, especially seeing everybody's everybody who knows it as somebody who is not an entomologist, who is just a, a bug enthusiast, as you can tell by my butterfly earrings. Um, I, I genuinely appreciated it. And it, I, I'm gonna echo what I've seen in the chat, which is that we're so grateful to have all of you here, Lois and Allison, I'm gonna give you all both a, a special shout out that mud because that's been uh, shown in the chat. Thank you both so much for being here. Um, we're right about that time where we're gonna start the audience Q and A's. Before we do, are there any other questions? And we can continue asking questions as, as they pop up or if um, an audience question prompts any other ideas for any of you, please feel free to jump in. So we have one that was really, really cute that I wanna point out and I'm gonna scroll up if you all don't mind so I can make sure. And I do wanna point out, um, Nico is doing a great job, a very scientist thing where he's responding to things in the chat and giving sources. So thank you so much, Nico, for, for giving those resources to our audience attendees. Um, oh, I'm so, uh, one of the questions that we got was that uh, Katie's listening with her seven-year-old self-proclaimed future entomologist, and they would love to see a bigger insect exhibit at the museum. Um, one of the questions that they had that is has been popped up in the chat is, 
Um, what do you consider interesting insects, both in our region? And how do you inspire, Lois, I'd love to know, how do you inspire the future generation of entomologists? Because we have quite a few in the chat that are, are curious or just uh, uh, bug aficionado starters. So how, how did you get into it? How do you inspire the next generation? Well, I got into it by, by being a chemist and I needed a job, a half-time job. And I got a job in the entomology department. And the professor said, would you make coffee and tea for me, for us? And I, because the secretary doesn't like to. And I said, yes, I've got a Bunsen burner as a chemist going or something. I, I, it'll be easy if I can sit there and listen to you talk about insects because I know nothing about insects. And they just made them so fascinating. Ants live in colonies. The colonies are the size of New York. The, um, they have farms, they, they, they grow fungi, they, they make war, they take prisoners, the prisoners try to escape. All these things they were telling me it was just fascinating. So I said, I would like to take the beginning course. I'll continue to be a chemist, seeing how long insecticides stay on plants, but, um, I would like to, to take the course so I can know more about entomology. And it was just fascinating. So that's how I became one. Now, for a beginner now, it depends. If, if you're married, then try to have a, um, either an entomologist's husband and wife or have a, a birder because they'll go out in the countryside with you and help you catch insects or, or at least stand around while you do. Once we went with a, a woman who was not at all interested, she took a, 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 a blanket and a book and we'd say, oh, this place looks fantastic. Get out your blanket and book and we'll be here for half an hour or so. And then we couldn't find a single insect there and that we, that, that we were looking for. And so in five minutes, she, she'd get back in the car. And she, she just hated us by the end of the day because we were always misjudging what we would find. And so my, my best spec recommendation is if you're going to be an entomologist and want to get married, either marry another entomologist or marry a birder because they can stand in the corner and watch for birds while you're collecting. Well, Lois, I'm going to have to break the news to my husband that uh, this isn't working out because I really, I'm really intrigued right now. <laughs> um, so speaking of inspiration, one of the questions that we got in the chat is actually for Allison. Um, Allison, if you're comfortable sharing about what, what inspired you um, to, to focus on, on this story, I think we all agree it's a fantastic one. How did you come about it? What, what, tell us more. So, um, you know, Charlie and Lois made international headlines in 2017 when they went public with their collection. And I first read about them on the NPR website, read an article about them. Yeah. And I was just immediately, oops, I was just immediately fascinated. Um, you know, they have such a beautiful uh, love story. Um, but also the collection itself was just mind boggling to me. And I'd been filming insects for National Geographic. That's how I met uh, Frank. I filmed, the, filmed him working on the Colorado rainbow scarab beetle. Um, but uh, I, so I contacted ASU and they put, I talked to Nico and he put me in touch with Charlie and Lois. And then it was a, a matter of um, convincing them to let me come film and you know, originally I was going to make a five to 10 minute short piece. Uh, but once I met Lois and Charlie and I, I realized that there was a much more profound story there, um, a story about the love of nature, but also about the nature of love because they had such a deep love, uh, not only for each other, but also for their collection. And it really inspired me to keep coming back and filming and really, uh, dive into their into their love story. Wow, thank you. Um, I think we all felt that come through in the film, uh, both the love for the work that they were doing and the love for each other. Uh, so I think you told that story beautifully. 
Thank you. I agree. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Thanks, Lois. Thank you for letting me continue to come to film. I know I was probably, uh, it, you kept uh, wondering, I think, if I was going to be finished soon. <laughs> but your story was just so, so amazing. Um, and the work that, you know, the transfer, the transfer process of the collection was just overwhelmingly just profound. And, and the work that, you know, seeing Nico and the students working on your collection was so inspiring. Wow. They did work hard. They did truly work hard and carefully. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, speaking of folks who are working on the collection, we did have a question. Uh, first, an admiration for Nico come through in the chat. Our curator of our zoology collections did uh, comment on the setup that you have in your screen behind you, Nico, and said that they were jealous, um, that they would love to have something like that, uh, that they could just walk by and see all of it. So kudos. <laughs> um, but Thank you. <laughs> but one of the questions, and this can be directed to all of you, um, is what was in the collections? We saw a few different things. Um, and how did we, how did they get started? Like how did um, we focus on, and again, I'm pulling from my little notepad, but people were wondering, are there bees, spiders? How did you get inspired with the, the things that we saw in the movie? Nico? Oh, sorry. <laughs> People would love to know more about all of the different things that are in the collection. Oh, well, so the, um, we have Charlie's Weevil collection, which we estimate to be uh, a million specimens. Uh, it's a global collection. Uh, ditto for um, Lois's plant hopper collection. Collectively, those two occupy about 45 of the uh, double cabinets that you see in my background. Uh, that is uh, roughly 1,600 to 1,700 of the drawers chock full with insects. But in addition, we have uh, an ASU legacy slash active, mostly Southwestern biodiversity insect collection. That's called the Hasbro Insect Collection. Uh, and uh, we're further growing because we act as the so-called biorepository for a, a national ecological uh, monitoring project uh, that is called NEON. Uh, it stands for National Ecological Observatory Network. Uh, as part of that network, which is sponsored by the National Science Foundation, there are 81 field sites across the continental US, but also including Alaska, Puerto Rico, and Hawaii, where uh, invertebrates that fall into pitfall traps in the ground uh, are regularly sampled. So that would, for example, be uh, ants, uh, beetles, uh, certain other groups, spiders. Uh, they also collect mosquitoes. As a result of that, we probably, we don't count them individually, we get many of them in tubes acquire something between three and 500,000 uh, invertebrates annually for the next 30 years, uh, right? So we have a lot of material um, uh, at different stages of being explored and being uh, research ready and, and accessible. And so a lot of the day-to-day uh, -day work is both um, blessed by being surrounded by so much material and becoming increasingly, uh, you know, somewhat of a managerial um, operation. Wow, and uh, to that managerial point, we actually just got a question for Lois. Um, we saw, I, I think a lot of us take technology for granted nowadays. Somebody wants to know just about the little tiny ID cards and what the literal process was for individually labeling each one of those specimens. Well, I'm sorry to say that my handwriting has deteriorated completely. You can hardly read my read it now because I wrote so many tiny little labels. But also, you can print four-point type on a computer. And that's what you do when you collect more than one thing at a time. And you, you have to give the, the locality, the, the date, time of year, the, the date, and the collector so that 
anybody who wants to get further information can contact the collector and perhaps learn more. And uh, uh, I, I, my writing is just a terrible scribble now because of, because of all those terrible labels, but, but you don't want to type each one. So you type if you got 10 specimens or something or other like that, and then you do, go ahead and do it. But it's, it's, um, it's a labor of love. We have a little, I don't have one handy right now, but, but uh, what most labs have is they want the labels to be at the same height so that you can get your, you can pick the insect up and have, have it look at it the bottom side as well as the top side. So we have telephone books cut to make and, and twist it into a round shape. And that way the height of the labels is always the same. And that's kind of an interesting thing when you go into a university press and say, I want this telephone book cut in stripes. And they say, you won't be able to read it then. And I say, I don't want to read it. And this, was, this was especially difficult when we lived in Chile for a year and a half. They really couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't explain what I wanted to do. But here, at least I can explain in English. And, and that's, that's um, something that I recommend if, if you're a collector and go to a foreign country that you learn to say, I, I speak little of whatever language it is. Tell me please, yes or no, am I, is this the road to so-and-so or is this answer the question? That way you get an answer. Otherwise you say, is this the bus to so-and-so? And they say, blah, 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 blah. So in a foreign country, I use that all the time and it works. And well, it well, that is uh, a great tidbit. And that actually brings us to another one of these uh, questions that I pulled from the chat, which is earlier you mentioned that uh, you made a comment about being 93 in your memories, but you also said that you have some great memories. Is there any particular story that uh, you'd love to share with us. We've got about 13 minutes left. Um, so any anything that you that stands out from the years of travel that you did or any particular find or not find or a day that you were looking for something, um, anything like that? Well, this sounds silly, but I don't know what you give your husband and wife for, for a birthday present, but we gave our, each other was a, a place we wanted to visit. So we went to Machu Picchu. We went to um, uh, the, the Alhambra. We went to a um, place in India where, where the, the, that's famous. Taj Mahal? The where? Taj Mahal? Yeah, yeah. And all of these have wonderful memories while, while I still remember them. <laughs> and so, um, I think that's a good thing to do. To, instead of giving your husband a shirt for Christmas, give him a memory. Lois, I have to say, my now husband and I have been doing that for a couple of years. So getting that advice from someone who had a 55 plus year marriage is, it feels good. <laughs> so thank you so much. So the next question, well, before we keep going, are there any other questions that any of you saw in the chat that you want to, to point out or you have in your heart of hearts. Frank, you you were showing the um, the tool that I, Lois was talking about earlier. Yeah, that was what we used to uh, make all the labels on uh, on this on the specimen pin the same level. So you stick the pin in there, there are tiny little holes in there and the pin goes through a defined way. So defined distance down. So you have the labels uh, all at the same level. And the, these specimens over time, they, they get a lot of labels because first they get a label with all the data on, like time and location and collector. But then there comes an identification label eventually, hopefully. 
And then a few years later, somebody else identifies again and said, oh, well, that was wrong and put his own label on. So if you look in old collections in old museums, London, Paris, sometimes these specimens have, well, five, 10 different labels on. And uh, then of course, this is a little bit, well, then you, you, if you have so many labels, that many labels, then it doesn't really matter. But if you have three, four labels, then having them at a distance helps so much. If you have to read a thousand labels quickly, well, sort of quickly, um, and you have to distance them uh, 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 all the time from, from a thousand specimens, that is risky for the specimen and it takes a long time. So uh, in old collections that are not completely digitized, you still have to, and most collections are not completely digitized, at least in the insect world, um, you, have to, you have to consult the original labels regularly. So making your life easier with a little tool like this is, is really important. And uh, well, uh, this question, how, how we, we make these little labels, this is probably the best thing that, that ever happened to us uh, is, is, is the invention of the computer and laser printers. Before that, well, in the old times, 100, 150 years ago, curators at museums were only employed if they had a good handwriting because they had to write all these labels by hand. And uh, that was one of the rules at the, at the British Museum. And uh, then later they did it with typewriters and then they photographed a whole sheet of typewriter, uh, labels with typewriters. Then they photographed it and uh, made it smaller and then cut out the labels from the photographs. Um, I had, when I started a little printing machine with lead types that I could compose and then print every single label with with uh, a, well, like a little printing press. Um, so these, it, it was a nightmare at the time, but uh, now, well, you just type it in and print it out with a laser printer. If you made a mistake, print it out again. It's so easy. So this is, computers are not too bad actually. <laughs> well, it's, it's so interesting hearing your description of all of that, knowing that behind Nico, there are I more than one label per, per specimen there are thousands of handwritten ones from Lois with, with her handwriting back there. So that is, that gives us some perspective, definitely. I also had the, uh, the, tape, the four point type and set labels and you had to read the, read the letters backwards so that I don't know how to explain it, but at any rate, when, when you, you had to set type, you have to set it backwards. My goodness. And that was sometimes fun. Yeah, we don't really know how good it is these days, right? The good old times were pretty horrible for labelers. <laughs> I saw a question in the chat that I thought was really interesting. Um, it was to Lois, uh, what changes have you seen in entomology over the years? And this is said from a this is from a 13 year old who loves entomology. Well, the, the worst change I've seen is many countries now don't want you to collect in their country because it's their, their heritage. And in Brazil, for many, many years, you couldn't collect and take insects out that you could collect on private property. And then, the, then you could take those out because the private owner of the property would let you do it. So um, that restriction has, has been a problem. And sometimes they won't let you bring insects in to the United States because they, even if they're dead, they still think that that they could cause some problems. So that's a problem now. But um, I don't know. I, I, I haven't traveled outside of the country collecting for a number of years now. I don't know if it's changed, Nico, and if it's a problem anymore, but it, it was for a while. Uh, so it might be harder to collect now, but we still need to do it. We, we still need to know 
in what's in the places that we haven't collected and we still need to know what's changing in the places that we did collect so and then would that be uh like continuously kind of monitoring these insect populations i think i see in the chat that nico said that that's something that we're seeing more of in the field of entomology is these studies of insect populations over the over the years mm -hmm. What kind of benefit does that provide? Like, Well, if we have global warming, then theoretically mosquitoes will move further north. And, and, and um, there's one case, I, I can't remember what it is, but in California, they grow something and one of my, one of my insects, and, and again, this, I've forgotten the names and everything. One of my insects feeds on this plant. Well, they found out that if you plant in January, then by the time the insect comes out, the plant is large enough enough that it will, the population will increase rapidly. But if you plant in March or April, then the plant is not developed enough to have a large population so that, that the harvest is better. So crazy things like that. I mean, I don't know who thought of that wonderful idea, but it works. So we're learning, we're learning. One other question I had uh, for you, Lois, was that you mentioned how insects do a lot of the same things that humans do. Um, can you elaborate on that a bit more? I think. You've mentioned to me some really fascinating things, and I think um, the attendees would love to hear. Well, as I said, ants have two farms. They have a, a fungus farm for for the uh, vegetables, and they have then they they feed they sit around an aphid sitting on a, on a branch so that the birds won't eat the aphid, and and then they milk it for honeydew. So they get uh, a vegetable and, and a protein. And then the ants also have wars. Um, actually, we were, we were in Brazil one time when army ants came through and, and they said, do not kill any army ant. If you do, the others will, will gather around it and feed on it. And, and it will be worse. If you just sit there and watch it, it will walk through your house and walk out the other side and not be a problem. And it was true. And um, so we have, we are, I think now we know more about insects. We're watching their, their behavior more and uh, we're learning about them and that's good. When they have battles, what are they, when the ants have battles, what, what are they fighting over? Is it territory, uh, food? Well, I guess I've never ever watched them except the army ants that went through and they were looking for a new place to live. And probably they had used up the resources there or wanted a, wanted a new place with, with yes, with, with more food. Um, I don't think they go out deliberately to, to kill other ants just for the fun of it. But if it's competition, they're going to do the best they can to preserve their, their lifestyle and their locality. And Bees can communicate. They have a, a bee dance that they come back to the hive and they do a zigzag dance and they point it in a certain direction so that they, you know, the, the other bees, when they go out, know how far, know what direction to go. And they also know how far to go to get the, the honey that the, the, that the bees that are doing the dance have just found. So that's interesting. Uh, we didn't know that when I was a beginner in entomology. 
Um, so we're still got lots of things to learn. Those are all such human behavior as you're describing the, the patterns that we're seeing in animals um, or in bees and ants um, are all, I, of course I'm projecting, but uh, such like human things, even asking what do ants go over war for? Well, the same things humans do. <laughs> um, but that is about all of the time that we have. We have enough time just to go around any final thoughts before we, we play our PowerPoint out. But um, before we do, I do just wanna say thank you all so much for being here. This was so informative, so inspiring. Um, very grateful to have been a part of the conversation. We can start with Allison. Any, any parting wisdom or thoughts? I'm just, you know, I'm thrilled to have been able to make this film and to have met Lois and Nico. Um, and it's just, their work has been really inspiring to me. And I've been thrilled to also be here tonight because it's my three favorite entomologists in one, in one chat room. Thank you so much. Again, I it is on my rewatch list. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and post that link one more time in the chat for everybody who wants to watch it again or didn't get a chance to watch it the first time. Lois, any, any final words of wisdom that you wanna pass along to our audience? It's an open wide field, but remember your mate should be the bird watcher or, <laughs> <laughs> or an entomologist. Another, another entomologist, so there's no, no disruption. <laughs> thank you, Lois. Again, I, I cannot thank you enough for sharing your stories, your memories, and your wisdom and so much knowledge. Nico, any final final thoughts before we log off? Um, I want to say thank you to all of you, the Denver National History Museum. Um, that's not the right sequence of letters <laughs> for organizing this, for giving uh, Lois and Allison uh, and myself this platform and for promoting, you know, the causes and the spirit that we stand for. Thank you, Nico. And thank you for all of the great resources in the chat. Again, I love having scientists on because you know that they're backing everything they're saying up with uh, evidence and resources. Frank, any final thoughts as we're, we're saying goodbye? Yes. So let yourself be inspired by that movie. And if you find a bug, just don't squish it, study it. Particularly the, the younger ones amongst us. Well, I st started collecting insects when I was 10 and never stopped. And so at, if you're that age, you still like bugs because all kids like bugs. Well, most kids like bugs. <laughs> just keep liking them and get into it and uh, just try to study them, make a little collection. And if you really like it, stay with it. There's so much to research, so much to find out, so many new things to discover. You can discover species that nobody has ever seen before or recognized. Millions of people have seen that fossil beetle but didn't recognize that it's a new species. So yeah, you can, you can find out things if you, if that, inspires you to find out things, to create knowledge. It's much better than reading textbooks or learning stuff that is already known. Learning new things, that's the thing. That's really, really the, the exciting thing in life. And with bugs, with insects, you can do that. In Colorado, in Congo, well, wherever you have a permit to collect. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, again, thank you all for joining us. Uh, the Denver Museum of Nature and Science was very honored to have hosted this program. We will see you all at our next program. Thank you.